Okay, welcome back everybody. Uh, good morning, good day, good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from, and thanks to the folks hanging out in the room with me. Um, this might be the only track you see without a Wrangler, so feel special. Um, so my talk is Hacking Your Way to Better Outcomes Through Negotiations. So this is what we're gonna talk about today. I've got a little introduction. We're gonna go through some myths that I think are really important for folks to understand. I'm gonna go through some terms that are super helpful when you're thinking about negotiating. We'll go through negotiating your offer, negotiations at work, and Q&A. And the one thing I will say is I won't hit a lot of examples for negotiating at work until we get to that slide. So who am I? Um, my name's Lee. Uh, on Twitter, I'm underscore leisures. And I'm a principal security engineer. So when people ask me what does that mean, the way I describe it is I work on crazy large, crazy complex, super ambiguous security problems that haven't been solved for my company. And I love that because like all I do is strategy all day long. Um, so that's my day job. My night job is actually conference organizing. So I'm doing double duty here. Um, I also help organize B-Side Seattle for anybody in Seattle. And I actually co-founded my own conference um, on social engineering and OSINT, which is virtual again this year, just because of everything going on in the world. I have stickers, if you like stickers. So that's layer eight conference. And why this talk? Well, so I often get asked from folks, like how do I negotiate? How do I negotiate at work? How do I negotiate an offer? And I discovered a lot of people just don't know the mechanics of it. They don't know how to think through it. And I thought, well, I can, I can help, you know? So that's why I'm doing this talk. So hopefully my goal for you today is you walk out with something that helps you. All right, so myth number one. You must negotiate or you have nothing to lose. Well, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, so I think this is something people talk about because 20% of women don't bother to negotiate at all, which that means one in five. So you look around the room, you're like one out of five. There's, uh, there's not that many people in this room, but that's a decent number of folks, right? Um, and that's the most recent data. If you go back in time, it's actually even worse. So we're making a lot of improvements, but women and underrepresented minorities get punished when they negotiate. This is a known fact. The problem is you have this thin line between being assertive enough and being too assertive. And that's a problem. Um, and people face backlash. This, is, this has been studied by business schools. Like this isn't me just making it up. Um, it was really interesting. I was thinking back through all my salary negotiations I've always negotiated with men. I've never had a woman on the other end of the call. I thought, whoa, that's really fascinating. Um, I will make this disclaimer. I'm not the best negotiator ever. I have my own strategies and the things I want out of it. So just keep that in mind. I'm not saying I'm like the best expert ever. Um, so yeah, you must negotiate. I, I just don't think this is true. You don't have to, first of all. If you've got an amazing offer, roll with it. Also, you do have things to lose. So just keep that in mind. This is my other favorite one. Everything is negotiable. Um, every once in a while, I'll, I'll talk to someone. They're like, I'm so mad. I asked for more vacation time, and I was told no. And I was like, it's an interesting. I've never thought of asking for more vacation time, honestly. But if you work for a large company, they have policies. Getting someone to write an exception for you is pretty rare. I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm just saying keep that in mind when you think everything is negotiable because it really, really isn't. And then my favorite, negotiators are born, not learned. They're, that's not true. Like you can practice and get better. Like, as I said, I don't consider myself the best negotiator ever, but I've practiced and I've like got some strategies that help. So if you think you're terrible at it, you got time. You can make it better. All right, so here are some really quick terms. So BATNA. And this is, 
really interesting to me because I've watched a lot of talks on negotiating and nobody ever really talks about BATNA. Yet, if you ever take a class on negotiating, they always talk about BATNA. So what is the BATNA? It's your, it says, best alternative to negotiated agreement. We'll come back to BATNA, but BATNA is really important to understand. And the other one is anchoring. So when you go into negotiation, you have something you want, the other party has something they want, Let's make sure we've anchored in the right places. Sometimes people walk in and they're like, well, I can't earn, you know, like, I'm gonna make up numbers now, half a million dollars, I'm out. And I'm like, you can't anchor in just, like, whatever you want. Like, be reasonable. But keep that in mind, because that will actually really screw up a negotiation. All right, so congratulations, you got an offer. And now you're thinking, oh God, now what, right? Um, so do some groundwork. And what do I mean by that? I think it's really important to establish a relationship with the other person on the other line. So like now in you know, COVID terms, you're probably on a phone call. If you're more comfortable with video, ask for a video call. Make yourself comfortable. Also, the other person has to work for you. So make them want to work for you. So a lot of times when I'm talking to recruiters, you know, I'll start off the conversation, hey, how are you doing? How was your weekend? And you let them talk to you. You do a little bit of that like relationship building in the first five minutes because you really do want them to help you, right? And you want them to care about the fact that you are there and you're trying to get to an agreement. I know that sounds like silly, but it really does go a long way because you're not just there to have an, like a business arrangement, you're trying to add that human touch. Okay, the other thing that's really interesting is if you ever do talk to someone about their weekend, you can learn a lot about them, and then you can keep asking other questions. I've learned so much about the folks I've worked with. I know their families, I know their dogs. Like, it's fine. You have those like five, 10 minutes, it's really great. You have the opportunity at the very beginning to ask questions. Now, I will say that I think good recruiters will tell you, oh, we have a range for a salary. Oh, you can negotiate your sign-on bonus, if that applies. Oh, you can negotiate your RSU package or options, if that applies. Now, that may not apply to every role, but let's say they don't tell you. You can ask questions. This is your one shot. Get as much data out of that other person as you can, right? Just be like, hey, you know, can I negotiate any of this? Like, is there any wiggle room here? Like, however you're comfortable spending that conversation, do it. Because without the data, you're not going anywhere. And this is the important part. You thank them, you wish them a good day, and you set up an appointment to talk to them later. I don't care if they've given you the best offer ever, do not accept it immediately. Give yourself some time to think about it. Be gracious. I'm so excited by this opportunity, thank you so much. But seriously, pause the conversation and figure out a time to talk to them again. Preferably like quickly, but not immediately. All right, so now we're gonna spend most of our time on this slide. Like everything in life, it's all about preparation. So let's go back to that BATNA, right? Um, I don't know about other people, but I don't tend to think really quickly on my feet. Like I'm not, I'm not really super quick. I like to prepare. I like to take tons of notes. Um, and that's kind of critical because I, I don't know about other people, but I find negotiation stressful. Like especially with salary, right? Um, you're trying to get a new job, you're excited by it, but you've got to get certain elements, right? So the BATNA is really interesting, right? And so you figure out from your perspective what happens if this falls apart. You know, to make your BATNA stronger, there are things you can do. Obviously, you can get multiple offers. Now, that's not always going to be the case, right? But you really want to understand how do I make my negotiation side stronger? And then you need to figure out what the other person's BATNA is. And this is where it gets really interesting. And remember I said chit chat can help you? Um, sometimes you can get out of the, like, the other person, how many other people have applied? 
how many other candidates they're considering. Are you the only one? I mean, that will strengthen your position. Now, they're not gonna always tell you. Let's be clear about that. Some people will be very hedged, but as much information as you can figure out, the better. And just, you can also start guessing. Um, a lot of companies, you know, will bring in three to four candidates. Um, and you can be like, okay, well, they called me, it's been so many days, I'm probably somewhere on the list. Some companies, it's first in, first out, right? Like if you are the first person to apply and they interview you and they like you, the job's yours, right? So you gotta figure that piece out. And then you start your research. And you research, you research, you research. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's a lot of great resources online. And go find out what are people paid. Now, I'm gonna caveat this. There are a lot of great resources online, but remember they're all self-attested. So people are saying, oh, I earn X. One of the funniest stories that I got uh, around this was a friend pinged me and she's like, oh, I got this job this big company, it's this level, and I saw on this app, people at that level earn a total comp of a million dollars. And I was thinking to myself, I don't think that's accurate. Um, I thought about it, and I, was, I wrote her back and I said, you know, I bet there is somebody that gets that. I 100% believe it, because there's a lot of really amazing talent out there. Maybe they work in something really unique, but it's an outlier. I was like, did you see like 20 people say they earn a million dollars or is it literally one human? <laughs> oh, I just saw one. Ignore that data, that data is not helpful. Like that will just make you mad because you'll anchor at that a million dollars. Don't do that to yourself. Okay, so you've done your research. You've also been paying attention. You've been looking to say like, okay, there's these outliers. Here's what I'm seeing as an average. There are a lot of sites online, right? Like you can pick your favorite. Just as I said, be a little careful with the data that you see. Okay, lean on your network. You probably have people in your network that maybe work at the company you're interested in. Maybe they're a hiring manager at the company that you're interested in. One of the most telling things ever for me personally, I was going to negotiate a new role and I literally asked my male colleagues at different companies, granted, what they earned. I almost fell out of my chair when they told me their numbers. I did not realize, because I hadn't been paying attention to the market, I'll be really clear about this. I didn't, re like I and I kept being told, oh, you're top of band. You, you're, you're great, like we, we're paying you really well. And yeah, they weren't, I mean, to be honest, I wasn't being paid really well. Maybe it was top of band, I believe them. Like I have no reason to doubt that. But talking to my male colleagues opened my eyes. So when I went to negotiate for that role, I got a 45% increase on my total comp, which is not Trump change, let's be clear. But ask everyone you know. Like, I, we've got to stop making salary and total comp taboo. We need to start talking about it. The more we talk about it, the more power we gain. Because, like, honestly, sometimes you'll have a horrible recruiter who's like, I'm going to save the company money. I get it. Like, there's even probably some benefit to them. But don't let yourself be trapped by that. Like definitely lean into your network. Okay, so now you have the offer, you've figured out your BATNA, you've done your research, you've thrown out the outliers, you've talked to your network, you have a good sense of what you should be earning. Awesome, now what? Well. Decide what you want and figure out where your anchor is. So my anchor has always been around my base salary. I don't necessarily recommend that. I definitely did not come out ahead because I, bank, I definitely anchored there. 
Um, but you don't know what the stock market will do. So like, that's fine. Like hindsight's 2020. I don't care. Um, but that's what's important to me, right? And I know that's the thing that I really, really care about. So for me, that's where I start. That's, that's the number I have to hit. And to me, everything else is extra. So I figured out what I want, but I have to have a rationale if we're not on the same page, right? Let's say I say, oh, I need, uh, I'm gonna start making up numbers again. I need $100,000. And they're like, no, no, we can only pay you 90. And you're like, okay, but I, I actually need the, the 100,000. But you have to be able to explain why. So years ago, I got this really great offer from this company. And I thought, oh, I got this great raise. And then I went and did some research and realized my entire raise was eaten up by my transportation costs. Um, I had to take a bus to a train to a subway. It was a lot of money to do that, as it turned out. And the employer I was at actually paid for my transportation, right? So I remember being like, oh God, I'm not gonna, like this isn't good. And I went back to the recruiter and said, you know, this is a great offer, but here's the dilemma I have. I'm not actually getting an increase. And I can see why you think I'm getting an increase, but I'm not. Like I'm not coming out ahead. And here's the cost it will be to me for transportation. And he listened and I said, can you meet me halfway? Now, there's plenty of people who would have said, can you cover all my transportation? And if you're one of those people, awesome. I wanted to get to an agreement. So I wanted to show I was willing to negotiate it and not be greedy about it. Ironically, later I found out that my skip level was angry that I had negotiated. He thought they had given me the most wonderful offer in the world, right? And uh, he wanted to pull the job offer. So remember how we talked earlier, there are risks? There are 100% are risks. Another story for that is I had a colleague who was really upset. He had gotten a great job offer, paid a lot more, and he fell trapped to myth number one. He thought he had to negotiate, and he asked for 10% more, which doesn't seem like a lot in the grander scheme of things. They pulled his offer. Why did they pull his offer? He literally just asked, can you give me 10% more? with no rationale. Not, I bring this to the table, I'm unique this way, I have this other expense, nothing. Just, I would like more money, please. So, when you're going to ask for something that's not what the other party has agreed to, have a reason. And it, like, literally, your reason can be, I'm the most amazing thing since sliced bread. If that is true, and you can back that up, go for it. Um, I would be careful with it, but if you, I'm, I'm dead serious. If you are just something amazing, make sure they know that. And maybe they're willing to give you a bit more. Um, concessions. So this is what I was saying, like, for me, I just wanted a little increase, which is why I was willing to say, can, we, can you meet me halfway? But you've got to think about where are you willing to make trade-offs. So let's say someone gives you this great salary, but you know, not a whole lot of equity, and you really care about equity. What are you willing to trade to get more equity? Are you willing to take a lower salary? Like ask them, like, hey, would you maybe drop my salary a little bit much so I can have more equity because that's what I care about? Like it's fine to tell them what you care about. A lot of people will try to be super closed in when they negotiate, and that's awful, right? Like, how is the other person gonna help you if you don't ever tell them what you need? And you don't engage with them. And then, I mean, we're all security pros, so tabletop exercises. I 100% recommend practicing. I 100% practice, both practice with someone who's super willing to give you what you want, and someone who pushes back hard on you. Like, just ask your friends, you can write up the, the exercise, but if you practice, 
you won't get flustered when they're just like, what are you, like, what's wrong with you? Why are you asking me for that, right? Like, take the time, because this matters. This matters for this point in time, it matters for a later point in time. So there's no harm in, in table topping. And if you don't know anybody, you're at this great conference, start talking to other humans, start networking, find somebody who's willing to do this with you. And I do recommend somebody who's, who's really pushed back on you, because I think that's when people get flustered. Right, when it's going really well, a negotiation's awesome. When it's going horribly, a negotiation is not awesome. And so that's why I do recommend getting somebody who can be like, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, no, and see how you can respond, right? Because what I don't want you to do is to go in assuming the other party is on your side, because what if they're not? Like, we really hope that they are, but I can't guarantee that for you. All right, so I didn't have this up as a myth. But one of the interesting things is that people believe whoever goes first in a negotiation loses. Like, you will hear that over and over and over. And I'll be honest, when I was first, you know, early in my career, when I was first negotiating, I, I let the other party go first. Now, oddly enough, I'm letting them anchor the conversation. So they're telling me what, you know, hey, here's the offer, you know, glad you had some time to think about it. As a reminder, here's what the offer is. They're anchoring. They're telling you where they're gonna start from. It's fine. If that's what you're comfortable with, do it. I don't do that anymore because I know exactly what I want. And so I just start the conversation. Hey, thanks for the offer. Here's what I want instead. And here's why. But you aren't going to lose if you start the conversation. So it's fine, you can start. If you're not comfortable, 100% let them start the conversation for you. The other really important part is keep calm and carry on. Like, I can't stress this enough. You cannot get emotional. I know it can be disappointing. I know it can be, you know, super exciting. I'm not saying, be monotone and uninterested, but be measured. Like, express the excitement, but don't like be too, too effusive. Like, I do think being really calm will benefit you. And the other thing is, if the negotiation is not going well, stop it. There's no problem with saying, I need to take a pause. Like, people should expect that. And if you aren't comfortable saying, I need to take a pause, just make something up. I heard a loud noise, my dog's going nuts, there's somebody at the door. I mean, all these things are legit, right? So you can, whatever, if you're not comfortable asking for the pause, just come up with a reason why you would need a pause and come back to the conversation. Okay, so we've talked about all the stuff that goes into a job conversation. And that's really where most people think they negotiate. Here's the thing. Negotiations and being able to negotiate are 100% a leadership skill. If you wanna grow your career, you need to find what leadership skills that you need to grow. I recommend negotiations. I think it's a really important skill because you will 100% use it at work every day. For people who don't think you negotiate very often, um, how many people in here live with someone else? I mean, a decent number, right? Do you ever have the conversation of like, what do you want for dinner? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm dead serious. And then you go back and forth forever, figuring out what you want for dinner. You negotiate every day, right? So the better you can get at it, the more successful you'll be long term. That, that's just my personal opinion. So here's the scenario. You're we're gonna pretend for a minute that we're all security engineers. If you're not, that's okay. Just kind of hang with me for that. And you found a vulnerability in a product. Also, this is purposely vague and we'll get into why. So you need the dev team to fix it. 
And the dev team says, that's neat. We have this huge feature release in two months, and no. Like, I, I just, no. <laughs> it's a very flat no. So what do you do, right? So we start with the BATNA. What is the best alternative to negotiated agreement? So this one, I think, trips people up. They're like, well, but they have to fix it. Like, that's what I need. I need them to fix it. And the dev team is like, no, I need to push my code for my product release, so no. So you're all going, or you're at an impasse. So here's the obvious BATNA. It's an escalation, right? It's the only thing at that point. If, you, if the two teams, like you as the engineer, oops, sorry about that, and the dev team can't come to an agreement, you're probably doing an escalation. So, I mean, now you figured out the BATNA, great. So now I know I have to involve, depending on my company, a director, a VP, or whatever. Um, okay, so I know that, awesome. Now, I left this vague on it for a reason. Now I gotta go do some research. And maybe I know this, but maybe I don't. Is the product um, customer facing? Is it a flagship product? How important is this product? You need to understand that because that's what's gonna drive the response by the development team. And it's fine to take a beat. Um, if you work at a company where things are very public internally, you can probably look at their Agile board. And you can look to see you know, what are they expected to do? What is their release dates? What's in their backlog? And look for historical information. Have they missed deadlines, right? Have they not been able to ship on time? You know, what has there been experience with the security team? Are, do they view the security team as a partner? Or do they look at them as a blocker? You need to understand all of this before you go back to talk to them. So you've done all your research. Remember I said lean into your network? Hey, call other people. If you know other people at the company, be like, hey, do you know anything about that dev team? Like, what, can you tell me a little bit more about them? Like, pick up the phone and do that. Because again, you wanna research, right? And then figure out, okay, so we got the vulnerability. How bad is it? You know, hopefully it's not a zero day. If it is, it's probably a different ball game, I'll be really honest. But like, how bad is it? And is there anything we can do that's a compensating control? Is there anything we can, we can give a little on? Um, we won't know, right? Like until you're in that situation, you won't know. Um, when I work with development teams, I need them to do something and they're unwilling, which let's be clear happens, I think, will happen to you at some point in your career. Um, a lot of times I ask, what can I do for them? Like before I even go for like, I need you to do a thing, it's very much like, hi, I'm from security. What can I do for you? Because that, that kind of flips the approach, right? They're like, oh, well, you're, you're, you want to be a trusted partner. You want to help me. And so you're starting to earn that trust, right? But let's already say like, I got the vulnerability, I need them to fix it, they haven't fixed it. Sometimes it's, hey, it looks like we're not gonna be able to agree. How can I help you make the case to your leadership about the importance of this? What's the kind of language that appeals to your leadership? A lot of times I use risk-based language because that's much easier for leaders to understand. But a lot of times it's like, how do we partner to tell this story together? They probably can't push, you know, the release. Maybe they can, you know? You can ask, like, is this a public release? Have we announced the dates? Is there any wiggle room? Do you have any slack built into your schedule? Have you had other problems? Do you have other blockers? This goes back to how can I help you, right? You can be that trusted partner, that trusted negotiator. Now, you're not gonna always succeed. I'm gonna be really clear about that. There are gonna be times where people tell you basically, go away. 
And we know the BATNA. The BATNA is we're gonna escalate to leadership. And that's okay. But you knew that going in. You took all the steps to make it possible. And so you go. So I've talked kind of fast, so I apologize for that. Um, so I didn't really get into like, how do you think through the numbers? And so I did want to uh, call out these two really great talks that were done here. Um, so in the virtual session in July, there was don't settle for less, know your value, where they really walk through how do you figure out how to get you know, paid. Um, in 2020, it was also virtual, is getting paid like a boss. Um, so they're both on the YouTube channel. You can totally go watch them at any point. If you really are like, I still need more help, um, Getting to Yes is probably one of the most famous negotiating books out there. And then I think they wrote like sequels, like Getting Past No. Um, but it is used in almost every business course there is for negotiations, that is still the book they use. And I think it's actually really well written and it can really help you sort of lock in where you need to be. So if you don't like watching videos, and you're not big on you know, opening a business book, which is legit, I get it, um, you can actually do a MOOC. So that's a, I, I can never remember that, what the acronym stands for, but it's this massive online community. Open, I always drop the word open, every time, without fail, it's kind of funny. Um, so the two really big ones are edX. So edX was spun up by, I wanna say like Harvard, MIT, a bunch of Ivy Leagues came together. They spun up their own, um, so that's, that's kind of the caliber, I guess, if you will, of courses. And then there's also Coursera is one of the really large ones. These are both uh, spun out of academics, or at least have academic missions. So, and normally, you can just take the courses or they're really cheap. And by really cheap, I mean like, I don't think they're more than $100, right? So. And I know for some people that might be a bit of more money than they want, which is why I recommend the two other talks that are free. And obviously you can rewatch this talk if it helps you. Um, so remember how earlier we were talking about where to research and where to get uh, data? So levels.fyi is my personal recommendation. Part of the reason I like levels.fyi is that they'll actually help you figure out levels. I know this sounds strange, but like the word senior, staff, principal means something different at every company. So you really wanna understand that. Um, they also have a lot of salary data. Again, it's whatever people say. You see something that looks weird, it probably is. Again, please don't anchor on those outliers. Um, there's a lot of other sites. Glassdoor is the one that was most common. Um, and today, as more and more uh, legislators pass uh, laws, more and more companies have to publish this information. So if you, if you happen to be looking recently, you probably thought, ah, this job pays between X and X in Colorado. Well, it gives you more data than you had, so take it. Um, I'm pretty sure California has passed recent legislation and Washington has passed recent legislation that you'll start to see will influence what these employers have to publish. Um, obviously, there's a lot of other sites. I'm not gonna go through all of them. And again, they're the ones that I'm always like, ooh, that's a lot of, I don't know if that data is accurate. 